I have two on the agenda today is the adoption of the July 13th minutes. Uh, any corrections, amendments, or minutes? Comments? All those in favor are on that. I move that we accept the minutes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, 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 all those opposed? Motion carries you. So the next item that we have is, uh, and we're pleased to announce that we have Kristen Alback with us today. Um, she is the new director of Pima County Island Care uh, and of the new department. Uh, Pima County Care is now a department in the county, and it's not under the health department anymore. So we have uh, some autonomy, and it, we uh, I think that she'll get into this maybe. But, um, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us where we want to be able to assist her with building that new department in the direction that she needs to go. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here tonight. I asked for just a few minutes of your time to introduce myself and tell you a little bit about where I came from and why I'm so excited about the future of uh, Pima Animal Care Center. I began my career in animal welfare in the late 1990s in Ohio, um, working for a local humane society as a cruelty agent. And at the time I started working in animal welfare, uh, about 85% to 90% of the animals coming into my shelter were dying. Um, there were no outlets, there were no volunteer programs, there were no foster programs, there was no rescue partnerships. Um, there were no lifelines for animals, and the community was kept out of the shelter. They weren't allowed in the doors, they were never allowed to see in the back. Some of you may remember these dark days of animal welfare. And at the time, 10 to 15 million homeless pets were dying in the country every year. And I worked for a very brief time, um, and was, was frankly, a, I was a young professional at the time, who was really pretty traumatized by my experiences. Uh, working in animal welfare at that time and didn't stay in the field for long and it wasn't until 2012 after an entirely different career going to college and graduate school at the Ohio State University and teaching at Ohio State um, on something totally unrelated that I had the opportunity to come back to animal welfare at a time when everything's changed. The world has changed for animals. Instead of euthanizing 10 to 15 million animals, we're down to fewer than 3 million animals dying in this country. And PAC is no exception to that trajectory. Um, I worked in 2012, I worked in uh, Fairfax County, Virginia, which is just outside Washington, D.C. I went into a shelter that had about a 70% save rate. It had full adoption restrictions on any dog's legal pit bulls. I worked very closely with my advisory commission in Fairfax County and got those restrictions overturned. When I got to Fairfax, 85% of the dog's legal pit bulls were dying. And when I left, um, about 8% were still euthanized. So we turned things around for big dogs there. And it, our advisory commission was really at the heart of that change. I went on to work in Austin, Texas, at a shelter that's about exactly the same size as PAC. And as um, some of you may know, Austin is the largest life-saving community in America at this time. PAC's following closely behind. Um, Austin achieved no kill status uh, about six year, five years before I arrived on the scene. But I arrived to a community that had gotten to life saving through a lot of infighting. There was a lot of anger. The community was really fractured. Um, rescue groups and partners weren't working together. Um, and people had bad feelings about each other. And I spent two years there and I learned so many lessons. They're saving, when I left Austin, we were saving a raw 98% of the 20,000 animals coming into that shelter. But while I learned a lot of lessons from them, what myself and my director were able to bring to that community is opening the doors to bring in the rescue partners, uh, our volunteers, our fosters, really opening the doors to say we all needed to work together. This is a different time in animal welfare than many of us started in. And all of that fighting that so many of us experienced to get where we were at is no longer the answer. The answer now is all of us working together. So I wasn't really looking for a job when I found out Jose was leaving, but he's been a close colleague of mine. And um, I came to visit and got to meet with Dr. Garcia. 
and got to meet with the PAC team and realized that how much I wanted to be in this community because you may not recognize what you're already doing, but you're making national history. Um, PAC this past July just had its most life-saving month on the books that I can tell. Uh, we did 10,000 adoptions last year at PAC. That's more than uh, we did at Austin Animal Center, as successful as we were. And unlike in Austin, there is no large lifeline rescue partner for the most at-risk animals. It's all happening inside the walls of the shelter. So um, I was amazed at what you were doing here, and I wanted to come be part of the change that leads this community forward. So. I'm thrilled to be here. I've gotten to have um, a lot of face time with Barry and the friends of PAC, and I'm looking forward to meeting and speaking with all of you about how we can all work together as we move forward in the future in a truly collaborative way, not just to help pets in our shelter, but to really look at the health of people and pets in our community <coughs> and to help more animals stay out of the shelter so that the animal shelter becomes truly a last resort, an emergency room and um, a, a site of triage for our animals, but that we can do so much more of our work out in the community. So, thank you, and I, this will be my third advisory commission that I work with, and I, so much important work happens in these meetings, and I've been involved with some great changes that have happened in advisory groups. In Austin, we passed this Strayhole Ordinance, which was the first of its kind, which allowed us to transfer medically at-risk animals on the day of intake, while still, keep, while still helping your owners find them if they were looking. We were able to do that because of the work of the Advisory Commission, so um, I look forward to working with all of you, and thank you for um, everything you're all doing. Great. Thank you, Kristen. You know, um, about a year ago, this, this community was reformed into what we call Act Act 2, and we had a lot of uh, big shoes to fill from the people that had served in that position for a number of years. And I think that I can speak for myself by saying that the people on this committee, I think, are really highly qualified and uh, motivated people. And I am anxious and, and I look forward personally for us all to work with you. So I'm glad to have you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, with that, the next thing that we have, item 3B. Oh, mm -hmm. Dr. Garcia. <laughs> First of all, I apologize for being late. I was trying to do something in my car um, that was relevant to the pack. But you don't want to know. Um, but I, I want you to, um, so first of all, uh, I, I want to be here to, to introduce um, Kristen because um, you know that, that I am probably one of the, the biggest boosters of our, our leadership team and of our staff and volunteers um, within the Animal Care Center. Um, I, I think the world of Justin and, and Michelle and Karen and Keo and they have, they take us um, forward every single day, um, as have um, the folks who have been previously filling the leadership role, um, Jose, um, Kristen, and, and ultimately Kim Jane. Um, those are the, uh, I think that, that these folks do tremendous, tireless work every day. Um, but I also recognize that we are ready to move um, to a different level of sophistication and a different level of impact. Um, and for that reason, um, uh, Mr. Huckleberry, in his great wisdom, uh, allowed us to go out and um, find the best person that I could find um, in a national kind of context um, to bring to the leadership of our agency. Um, and so that's how Kristen has gotten here. That's why um, we have worked so hard to move the pack into becoming its own separate freestanding department. That's why we will continue to engage with our fundraising partners, with our rescue partners, with our volunteer community, and with our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful staff who show up every single day. Um, in order to, to get us there. So I, I'm really I'm really thankful that, that Kristen accepted the job. I was almost like, I, I almost couldn't believe it. <laughs> 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 um, and so I, I was super, super, super happy. I, I also want to sort of say that, that 
my role is to help facilitate our continued progress forward. Um, Kristen and I are partners in this process. Um, she's the subject matter expert. Uh, I'm the person who knows how to navigate the, 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 the politics uh, and the policy side of the equation. Um, and I think together with our, with our staff um, and with our team, um, are, are, are really positioned in, in a good place to move us forward. It, it's not going to happen tomorrow, um, and, and, it's not, and, and we will make many mistakes along the way. Um, I know because I, God knows I've made many. Um, I'm sure Kristen has um, made many herself in her career too. Um, but I believe that we are in moving in the right direction. And with your guidance and with your support, we will continue that forward trajectory. So that was the only comment that I wanted to make. And, and you will, at the next Board of Supervisors meeting, um, there will be an action taken by the Board that will appoint Ms. Auerbach as um, the County Administrator's official designee. That has to be approved by the Board of Supervisors, uh, and that will be uh, official with this next board meeting. So uh, I also want to let you know about that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Uh, I just, Kristen, I want you to, we are so excited about the staff and all the progress, and you were so right to say it's day by day. There's something new and good that happens. But I want you to look around, because these are our friends. Yes. Most people are here every meeting, and they're fabulous, and and so our volunteers at PAC, our volunteers in the community, and our volunteers in all the organizations are just fabulous, and you're just going to love it. But but a special thank you to you all who yes. come every month and meet with us. We thought we might just take a moment uh, and let the committee members introduce themselves to you and tell you a little bit about, you know, like a sentence about your background, where you come from, and if you remember who you're appointed by. <laughs> I can look at the chart and you, know, the, you might want to tell her. So we'll start with Christy. Hi, um, so we've met already. Christy Hollicker, I'm the volunteer representative at PAC, and um, I work with engineering. And then I'm Barry Kalaski, and I was appointed by the county manager. I'm Andy Squire. I get to have an appointment with you on the 29th day. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> you have a very busy calendar already, so bless you. I know it's going to be crazy. Um, so I'm the partners representative for those partners that are left, the Aurora Valley City of Tucson. Um, and uh, uh, we're really excited, very, very excited. And the steps that have been taken, Kino and the team, um, have, have done an amazing job out there. Everybody out there, considering the, the stress that the facility's been under, the, the issues that have been going on in the community, um, they've done a great job. The city, of course, has major concerns as Sonora Valley with cost containment. So your statement about, and you know, Dr. Yeah, Francisco's statements have been really clear. Our goal is, just like yours now, to come alongside of you, no more animosity, no more kind of battling, figure out how to work effectively in the community to reduce the number of animals going to the shelter. That's the only way we're going to reduce our costs. Um, and, and I believe now Mayor and Council truly recognize that. The majority of our community recognize that. So I'm really looking forward to having those discussions and our city managers as well. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tammy Berry with Friends of PAC, and I've had the, the honor to welcome you to I'm Kristen Almquist with an I. 
So we had a lot of Christians around. Um, and I, my background is marketing strategies and community engagement. Uh, and I'm newer the last three years to this rescue animal care center world and loving it and feel like we're all working very well together. I'm Suzanne Lee, and I'm outside here from Jack's consultant. So completely on the other spectrum. Um, but I am an animal, passionate animal lover. So I was uh, made it a point to get appointed to the board. I represent the strip of So look forward to it. And actually, I represent uh, Steve Christie's district. So it's the far east side, north and, and east. And I was appointed by Ray Carroll, who had been very active in the community. and then. He did not run for re-election, so now I'm Steve Christie's person. Y'all done? Y'all done. Hi, I'm Monica Nina, and welcome. And I think it's wonderful, the model that's been chosen to go forward. I think it's going to be a great thing. And I get a lot of support, so thank you for accepting. It's a good place for us. Uh, my background, I have been in commercial banking, and I currently serve as the Panola Valley Town Council member. And I also um, have, was appointed by Raymond Valadez, um, District 2, and um, I served as the bond treasurer for Pets for Worth Saving, which was a bond that helped fund our new person. And I tell you, that was an awesome mm -hmm. It was just a wonderful thing, so proud to be a part of it. I'm Dan Extra, I'm a retired but recovering politician. <laughs> <laughs> I served continuously for 32 years and four months, including being the mayor of the city of South Tucson, and four terms on the Pima County Board of Supervisors. Uh, and uh, I have not retired because I haven't figured out what I'm going to do when I grow up. I have a consulting, uh, consulting firm where I do mostly government relations, but I'm also real active in the Appointed by, I didn't even live in his district, but County Supervisor Richard Aeneas, District 5. And I was fortunate to be able to work. Now, Kristen didn't mention this, but she was the chair of the committee, Proposition 415 in 2015, that got the money approved by voters for the new facility. Rhonda was the treasurer, and uh, they allowed me to work on the campaign. <laughs> Good to have you here, and, and, and I'm really happy to see uh, Dr. Garcia the change to where now you report directly and, and, and you've gotten that kind of status. Knowing a little bit about county government, I think that is a real good thing that has happened, and I think a lot of good is going to come of it. Keep Dr. Garcia busy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gail Smith, I'm a retired OGYN in the East Coast. I moved here. No, 15 years ago, and I've been um, on the PAC Act Committee and the PAC Act 1, what point for the Board of Health. And I am impressed with the changes that I've seen since I started and how forward thinking the community, Pima County, is, is just really incredible. And I'm really glad that you came. And I'm really glad that you help us keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I have three me. Uh, we were supposed to uh, hear from uh, Anza today. I don't see her. Anza, uh, I think we have. Yeah, Anza wasn't able to make it, but I can share a little bit about her position within the context of uh, she, the report of that person. She hadn't had an opportunity to be introduced yet, so um, we thought that that would be nice to see understand what her role was. Go ahead. So, you. I ho hopefully have received by now um, this new report, and it's the July director's report. Um, it's actually a written report, not a statistical yeah. one. Um, I'll be providing these every month to the commission. I'll be publicly available <coughs> online, and we'll also be sending them to volunteers and staff members. Communication in such a large animal welfare organization is always tremendously challenging. And, I, I'm sure you've had the experience of a lot of time being taken up when you're just trying to get information about what happened the previous month. Um, and so hopefully we can prevent a little bit of that. 
and um, focus our time on, on all the important work we need to do by me getting in this report. Um, we're going to be quite busy, and change is going to be the name of the game over the next year. Moving into the new facility is going to change a lot of things for us, um, operationally, organizationally. Um, and so these reports will hopefully um, be of help. Uh, and if there's anything that isn't in this report that you'd like to see each month, please let us know. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just go through a couple of highlights. I won't walk you through the entire report every month, but there's a couple of things that I want to mention. Um, so we had a, a banner month. Uh, on this report, we, we let you know that 980 million pets were adopted. Um, but and say only 66 were euthanized total, and that should have said only 66 that were not owner requested euthanasia. Um, and this is uh, we looked at the numbers over a 10 year period, and um, in 2007 that number was 1,100 animals euthanized in one month. We've come so far. Uh, we're well, while we really want to celebrate the most life saving month in history. We're still facing tremendous challenges at PAC. Um, my second day, we, we received a 61 PAC for any case, but anybody hear about that on the news? Um, and this is one of how many party cases this year so far, Sheena? Four or five. Four or five. Um, and the, the conditions in this house were, um, were pretty difficult for the cats that came in. Um, they were all uh, oddly and unusually friendly and soliciting affection from the moment we, we entered the house. I was there when we went in. And these cats are all friendly and highly adoptable, but they're quite afraid of the shelter. And their case highlights why the new building is so important. Because they were put in a room that is that is away from dogs, but there's dogs on the other side and they can hear them barking. And you can imagine cats that have lived in a hoarding situation to go into that environment and have care of barking dogs is really terrifying. And the new building is going to alleviate all of that. Cats are going to be housed completely separately from dogs. Um, and so we've adapted out some of them. We're going to be placing some through rescue and are, are looking for outlets. We still have about 45 of those cats, and many of them are still being treated for serious medical issues. Uh, we, we're moving into a new system for animal handling. Um, we're going to be creating a DOT system, and I mentioned this in, in the context of this meeting because it has a lot of important implications for safety and for moving the animals quickly through the building. We're going to be assigning handleability levels to each animal, and that'll help us know if a brand new volunteer can handle that animal or if it's someone that needs more specialized training if that animal's really stressed in the shelter environment. So people will start to see changes to the actual physical kennel fronts of our, um, of both our cat and dog kennels. And along with that, we are trying to, cats are silent in shelters, and any of you who are cat advocates know that while dogs often show us signs of um, physical distress, cats don't. And, and because of this, and because we do still have cats that, you know, if a cat doesn't eat for three days, its life is truly at risk. And so because of this, we're going to be putting feeding charts. We have put feeding charts and health monitoring charts in the front of every kennel. And we're going to be doing that so that we don't lose any more cats. It's really hard in a shelter environment when you're dealing with the volume we are to not have them slip through the cracks. And so these charts will help us monitor whether the cats day to day um, are eating, going to the bathroom, and drinking water, which are the three things we really need to know about cats. Um, we <clears throat> have, so Tamsin, who wasn't able to be here tonight, is the newly hired behavior and enrichment coordinator. We've got anywhere from 350 to 400 dogs on site at any time. That's a massive number. It's hard to even sort of wrap your brain around it. But we, and we have people that clean their kennels. But without our volunteers, our dogs would sit in their kennels 24 hours a day. And with our volunteers, they're sitting in their kennels typically more than 23 hours a day. And that's just re reality of life for shelter dogs. Tamsin's initial focus has been providing kennel enrichment so that at least her dogs have something to do. We know that behavioral decline leads to euthanasia. When they, when they can't handle the stress of the shelter environment anymore, they become unmanageable, and that's when you can, needless euthanasia happens with dogs. So her first task was to fix that problem. And so when you see our kennels, it kind of looks like there's like trash in them. Not trash. Um, it's enrichment. We basically enrich toys um, and other items that we can give them, we're going to. Um, but she's also going to be passive starting dog play groups, um, which has now become a national best practice led by Amy Sadler's Dogs Playing for Life program, um, so that our dogs can get out of the kennel and we can socialize them and help learn what dogs are actually social with other dogs. 
which will move some of our medium and large dogs much more quickly. And Austin, all of our playgroup dogs had little signs on their channels that said, I have a playgroup rock star. And those dogs flew out the door. And they were some of our, you know, most uh, blocky headed guys who sit the longest, but the dogs that really were really playing with others just got adopted like that. So she's going to be starting play groups. Um, she's going to be focusing on the longest day dogs first. And we're going to be getting, thanks to the friends um, and the grant from Best Friends, we're going to be getting Mark Gill collars on all of our medium and large dogs. This is going to be what kind of Martin Gill collars. Um, this will be a significant step to improving handler safety, preventing escapee dogs from um, getting loose from their kennels, and it'll just overall improve safety and handling for all of our dogs. A Martin Gill collar is different than a typical collar. Okay, so you have a buckle collar. A Martin Gill collar has a little loop so that when the leash tightens, that collar tightens around the dog's neck so they can't slip out of them. Have any of you ever had a dog slip out of a collar? Sure. So the Martin Gill collar prevents that from happening, um, which is why we use them in shelters. Um, lastly, the last thing I want to mention is that you may have heard that starting um, yesterday, we began our training for our volunteers to have access to our shelter software system. Um, and met with Dr. Garcia in my first week. Uh, we met with all the appropriate county agencies, um, and we were able to move forward on this really quickly. This means that our volunteers will each have unique user identification numbers, very similar, just like our staff members do. So um, if Joe is in the shelter volunteering, Joe can log into a computer just like a staff member. She can enter notes into the shelter software system. She can read all the notes on an animal. She can enter photos. And importantly, she can assist with adoptions, with intake, with returns to owners in a way that volunteers have not been able to do in the past. Um, so this should be a really significant step towards empowering volunteers to help in every possible way that they can. Um, and I'll, you, I, I gave you way too many links. Uh, I know it's not going to come to all of them. But if you want to read all the news, we were definitely in the news a lot this month. Um, and so we'll, next month we'll probably just provide you a more abbreviated list, but that's all of our, um, our uh, media engagement this, this month. So if anyone has any questions about just a comment, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you uh, for that detail. Um, that was fantastic. Um, I, I know it helps the team to have somebody who helps compile all that now and put that together because that's like sort of the last thing on the list in the scramble when all that was going on. So this is great. It's extremely helpful um, to, to my manager um, and to my assistant city manager. Um, we're really we're excited. Um, Dr. Garcia, this will probably fall back to you a little bit more. We're really excited about the opportunity to look at um, a, a new licensing software opportunity. And uh, yeah, for both of you. And I know that Assistant City Manager Garland would love to partner with you all or talk about that as we've been running a very not wonderfully successful pilot for licensing at Parks and Rec. It's just been really small and challenging a lot of ways because of the system. So we would love to figure out how to partner on that moving forward so we can really make it, if not super easy, just on the web, accessible throughout the city, through the region, to help all of us down that path. So. Yeah, it, it, and uh, what, what we're talking about is web licensing. So there's a, a lot of available technology that we're not taking advantage of or in relationship to animal services. And one of those that we're looking at now is web licensing. So this would be an add-on service to what we already have available in the county. And it would mean that you could register, your, you could license your pets at home on your computer, you could go to a library kiosk to do it, or you could come to the animal center and register your pet on a kiosk. We would still keep the available service, um, the available license, existing license service, because um, some people don't have access to computers or aren't comfortable right. using them or any assistance. But this would be an add-on service that would increase compliance rates, improve customer service, um, and utilize all those new technologies to help us get more pets licensed to get them home faster. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the additional commentary that I would add is that this has been something that, that we that we've been envisioning, sort of bringing on right. at some point. Um, part of the reason why we have are trying to be methodical and, and deliberative about this is because there are revenue implications for our partner jurisdictions, um, and there are revenue implications for ourselves, um, and there are real costs that are associated with these things. But we feel confident that we have a strategy to try to understand those 
and our plan is to bring that back to the PAC Act and to the jurisdictional partners so that everybody can have eyes on how we're approaching this problem, what we think the pluses and minuses are, um, and, and to start talking about timelines for implementation and procurement and all that stuff. Great. Thank you. Just with regard to licensing, I just I mentioned this last time I was here and it came up, but um, involving the veterinarians is probably not a bad idea either, just because we give a lot of rabies vaccines and it, we had a, a way that was just really easy to direct our pet owners and say, we are to go here and license your pet, it's super easy. I mean, they normally do what we recommend, and so if we can, if it's super easy, then we can pass them off as well. Thank you. Um, I well, just one. I was at um, just going back to your partners and your fostering programs. I was at Hacienda the other day, the, the new assisted living on River Road, and there were three of your little kitties oh, with the residents, and they've been there since Friday. And it was a riot watching, looking at their charts and dots, because here they were bottle fed. And they had a lot of beginners. <laughs> but anyway, but, but that's exciting to have it be a PAC program and to have, you know, the seniors working yeah. and the staff. So anyway. Thank you. Um, the next thing was an update on the animal welfare, uh, animal welfare private property search. Paul's uh, yeah, can I mention just really briefly before we do that, you have two statistical reports this month, um, and I we wanted to provide you the most user-friendly data. I know I have I sometimes have trouble looking at the same numbers on one page, um, and so this offers some different representations of data. Um, so if we can continue, my my plan is to continue to provide both of those reports for you. Um, up until the point that we truly merged them and, and ensure that all the data from the initial report would be on the second, um, if that's... Well, I think the question would be for the community, and I don't necessarily expect an answer tonight, but I think if you take a look at the information that uh, Kristen is providing, is that adequate? Does it provide the kind of information that you feel you need to know? Uh, as compared to what we had come up with you know, previously. Uh, and may maybe maybe what she is providing is enough and we don't need to continue with the snapshot because remember we had a discussion and we were going to kind of go a little more yeah. and not get so in, yeah. in the weeds on this. So I guess the question is please look at this and maybe think a little bit about what's in front of you on the snapshot and I guess maybe for the next meeting, I'd like to be prepared to indicate to us if you think that the information that Kristen is providing is going to be adequate for us. Or how would you like to enhance it if not? Mr. Chair, might I suggest that maybe rather than just go one month, we maybe go a couple of months and just get us acclimated to what these are? Um, even for an old guy like me, I found it pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's uh, let's continue with the snapshot in your report for the next month in September, and then around and when we come up again in October, uh, we'll get, and, and, and maybe we'll give people time next week to ask more questions about the information that she provides here, and then we can go ahead and have some more discussion about it in October. If that's the reason for that. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, are there any questions on the information? This offsite event mentioned here, that's the one that we talked about here before, right? Where we were doing the. Who was there? Did you go? My first event, yeah. No. That's, is that the summary of that? It says the offsite event July 15th. So that, that's basically the um, figure. When you guys went to South Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what cool. it is. That's just basically breaks down to how many animals uh, received that specific microchips, rabies, FRCP. What's the FRCP? That's the cat. Oh, okay. And then the microchip. So the only thing I see that is missing, um, and that's um, 
my fault is that I should have um, also placed the number of how many animals were seen altogether. Mm -hmm. um, so that could have given you an idea of, so on this specific day, 293 animals were seen that on that property. So that you can gauge, well, if it was 293, 266 of the 293 had been the part of the stepper shot. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Chris, you know, the, what I heard you say was integrate. So you were kind of looking at merging with these two sort of in the, because uh, I love the, the dashboard component of this. The visual is very handy for a lot of people. Um, you know, uh, I certainly agree uh, that seeing these for a couple months and people getting used to them so they can have comment and that gives me an opportunity to go back to the partners and see what they like a little bit better is, is a great idea. Um, and I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, there may be a way to kind of merge, which would be awesome. That's kind of what I heard you say. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think I think what I was going to say is that there are specific yeah. information on yeah. pieces that we want to have. It useful to them to make sure that we communicate with Kristen. It's cool. All right. So back to the agenda. Um, is it okay to move on now, Kristen? Okay. Um, Sorry. I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> <Buckle> up, <Kristen>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all screwed up today. So, uh, so animal welfare, private property, search possible. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris had asked that I speak about this. Um, this was uh, something that I, I well, but first of all, let me start assuming that not everybody in the room is a Fourth Amendment expert, and I don't consider myself either, but I do have a, a, a long background in law enforcement. And this summer, working with <coughs> animal protection services at PAC, I noticed times when we should have been able to go into a residence because we knew that there were animals in there that were in jeopardy, and we didn't. And there are times that when we did go in, we found deceased animals. Now, whether they died as a result of that, that time period or not, I, we don't know. But it still is upsetting enough that I recognize that the, the Fourth Amendment obviously it, it, it protects all of us our right to privacy. It's one of the most cherished and I think most agreed upon amendments in the United States. And there's ten recognized exemptions to the Fourth Amendment, including search warrants. Uh, one of those is considered, they call the rescue exception, or the emergency aid exception. And it's been upheld for a long time. The Supreme Court of Michigan versus Fisher upheld that if a law enforcement officer or agent of the government has reason to believe that an occupant, and it's key that we use the word occupant, an occupant inside the building is in need of emergency aid or care, that the law enforcement officers or agents of the government can enter for that purpose. Um, and it's been recognized recently, there's a trend across the United States, most spearheaded probably by the state of Oregon, that that exemption can also apply to animals. Um, domestic pets, animals, it's been interpreted different ways throughout different communities. But there are about 13 states now that have made exemptions to recognize uh, the domestic pets or animals inside of the home as occupants uh, inside that home that need that, that need care or aid. So earlier this month, we wrote a, a, a memo requesting that, and this may be, as far as I can see, Pima County might be the first, if we do this, to ever codify it before it went to court. So that could be an interesting, an interesting thing. But we have made a request that a policy be adopted that gives our officers an exemption to the search warrant. Unlike law and order, if a law enforcement officer reaches probable cause, they can't go ahead and enter the home. They, on TV, they do. But that's not reality. That probable cause gives them reason to go seek a search warrant. Well, if, I, if I could say, we're talking about cases where we believe that there's no, there's no one on the premises, um, the, the owner is, is not there, and there's animals inside whose lives are at risk, who are in immediate danger. Um, when we know that there are animals whose lives are at immediate risk and there's no owner on site, um, we, are, we are drafting a policy and working through our diversity and our appropriate um, avenues to create a policy that will allow us to enter those homes simply to get the animals out and save their lives. Yeah. What I would add is that, is that there's, there's been a lot of conversation that a lot of time that I've spent with our Pima County attorney, um, in this case, supporting us, uh, Paul Ferreira, uh, in terms of even, even above and beyond any such change in policy, what are the things that we can do now and how do we facilitate 
the acquisition of warrants when we believe that they were necessary? How do we start creating processes that allow us to, to take more um, prompt action? Um, if I, one of the questions that I had for her was, when was the last time we asked for a warrant? Well, it turns out we haven't asked for a warrant in a very, very long time. Um, to me, that means that that we don't have a good process for deciding when a warrant is, ne is necessary. So, so I think that those are those are the kinds of things that we need to scrub. It's not going to be something because of the complexity. Of the it's not going to be something that that, that we resolve tomorrow. Um, and it is just something that's going to have to pass a lot of legal scrutiny. But but we wanted to let you know that 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 we are undertaking the homework that needs to happen in order to to make some some potential policy recommendations that may be appropriate for us to bring forth to the board, um, and, and, and certainly um, as we as we look at um, kind of the county's legislative agenda at the state level, um, this is one of the one of those things that, that I have put on my boss's desk as something we should consider. So um, so that it's a complicated issue, um, and we certainly don't want to trample on property rights and the county would have a lot of liability if we, if we exercise our our um, our ability in, um, in this room. So we need to be very, very thoughtful about this. I thought there's laws against negligence and abuse of animals. Correct. So how do you if you're suspicious that there's an animal in danger, how do you substantiate not doing something if these are county and state laws? Against negligence and abuse. You know, there is, I just find mine. You're, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, that even with those, even with those laws notwithstanding, um, the, the the recommendation of the county attorney's office is that we are we would still require a um, search warrant under those conditions in order for us to affect the the, the um, uh, rescue of those animals. And so. And so that's where it starts getting really, really murky really fast. And, and I think we, we, we just want to make sure that we, whatever solution we come up with, would, would stand legal muster and would, would stand in screw. Um, so, Ron, Mr. Chair, members, and Dr. Castillo, so the legislation that we just recently passed where a citizen could break a car window to get a Animal or person out. Um, how, how does that come into play? Or is it the CFS? What's the weight in this? Sure. Um, in, in, in regards to that, it's, that legislation um, exonerates the person from any civil or criminal liability if they break a window to rescue a child or a inside the car. Um, that's a situation that's pretty unique, it, 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 wherein it falls under the plain view doctrine, uh, where you can look through the window and see the child in pet distress. So under plain view, the, as a citizen or a law enforcement officer, you're granted a certain, a, a little bit of a hurdle over, over that Fourth Amendment right there. So you can look in and, and legally look in and see the situation and take immediate action against it. That, that law just exonerates you from civil or criminal liability if you do that. Interestingly enough, though, that state law does tie together children and domestic pets in the same law, recognizing that they both can suffer and both can die. The, the, the challenge is, is if a private, if you as a private citizen, um, sort of break the car window in order to rescue a pet, um, there's potentially a different type of liability that's attached to if one of our officers does. Um, and so, and so that's part of the reason why we need to we need to be thoughtful about how we implement. It, it, you know, uh, Kino is absolutely correct. If, if we see an animal in distress in that sort of situation, uh, we would obviously um, take action. But but we would do so with, with a little bit of exposure that 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 perhaps a private citizen may have that is would be slightly different. So that's why we want to be thoughtful and, and, and smart about whatever it is that we do in this space. Uh, I have a thought on this, and I would appreciate it if staff would tell me if I'm totally out of phase. But one of the things I wanted to interject into, into the discussion about this as we approach it is that uh, 
perhaps we need to view it a, a bit more broadly. In that, for example, if we have a hoarding case in the community, a human hoarding case that also includes animals, if we already have law enforcement officers that are charged with protecting the public health, safety, and welfare, there is most logically, in my mind, a really good possibility that there's a, a human risk element there, too. And if we all, you know what I mean, in terms of disease vectors, in terms of other things that affect the neighborhood, all of that. And instead of just looking at it that we need permission to go and rescue animals, there is also the, the aspect of this looks like a dangerous situation that may affect both human and animal welfare. And if we already have law enforcement officers, you know, with uniforms that have certain powers and privileges under those rights, I think that as we approach re-examining how we do this with the laws, we need to look at it that way. Because the question I would ask is if we have law enforcement officers on the side and they suspect that there's a dangerous, for example, if things are rotting in a home and it could mean that there, you know, are poisons, it could mean, you know, all sorts of things. And it affects the whole community's health in that, in that regard. So that's, that's all I was thinking. You know, we need to address it and, and call in the other agencies that might be able to help. Mr. Chair, you're, uh, you're absolutely right uh, from the standpoint that there is a, the, the, the health department and uh, has delegated authority from the Arizona Department of Health Services to declare something a public nuisance. However, despite the, our ability to, to declare public nuisance, it does not authorize us to enter into a private space. And so, for instance, uh, the, the situation that is most commonly happened up in uh, Maricopa not that long ago when we were dealing with the Ebola traveler kind of thing. Um, there, you know, somebody wanted to go and um, assess for whether there were uh, mosquitoes that could transmit this disease. Um, a property owner said, no, you can't. Um, and the pro property owner has that right. And, and even even despite the, 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 in that case, a very sort of clear sort of public health issue. Um, the other situation we come into more commonly here is when we are dealing with uh, vector control kinds of issues where we get calls about somebody has a green pool uh, that is breeding mosquitoes. Um, can, you, can you fix it? Can you do something about it? We actually have to go to court for a warrant that will allow us to um, actually enter that property in order to do that mitigation, even under the circumstance where there is active disease transmission. So, so yes, we do have some flexibility. I think the, the, the piece that, that you're talking about also, which is really critical, is, is the coordination with other law enforcement agencies. And so, for instance, in, in, in a relatively recent case, we're being called by the Sheriff's Department, by TPD, by the appropriate law enforcement. So, so our law enforcement partners actually do recognize that when, when they're dealing with a hoarding case um, and, and there are animals involved, that we are the right people to, to call. But, but you're absolutely right. These are complicated kinds of things that we need to continue to explore and refine. And if I may, in the, in the city's experience, certainly with hoarding, especially in my time working as a council aide, it, sadly, tragically, it's actually helpful to address the psychological uh, issues generally of the, of the homeowner, the person who lives in the home, get them help and get the home addressed if there's actually animals there. If there are no animals there to be addressed, if there's no violation of that or another reason to go into it, I have had multiple homes in neighborhoods where they are stacked to bills, the fire department knows it's a bomb waiting to go off, and there is absolutely nothing they can do to address it, even if it's almost full of walls and garbage. It's just, it takes such a hurdle to get over that area. I mean, you know, you're right. It would make sense. But where we've had the animals, uh, certainly in the cases in Tucson this year, we've definitely been dealing with, with folks with heavy, heavy mental health issues and then additional hoarding problems in the home. So we've been able to address those thanks to Dr. Grace's, you know, intervention as, as the health department. So it's, it's really it's kind of a tragic mix of problems. Not easy to hurdle. Susan? Some clarification, are we talking about entering onto somebody's private property mm -hmm. in the absence okay. of a homeowner? Um, so basically we walk up to the door, we think that something, that there's an animal in danger in the house and there's nobody there. Are we talking about entering at that point? Or are we talking about entering where there is a, uh, a person there that's basically denying us access? 
So first of all, if, if, as a law enforcement agency, the, the PATH officers already have the authority to enter through curtains to the home. And if they have reason to believe that a crime or evidence of crime is in sight, then we can seek a search warrant and go in. The exemption that we're looking for, or we're talking about right now, and the exemption is that any peace officer, any law enforcement officer, any agent of the government right now, has an exemption or we granted an exemption to that warrantless search if they believe that there's a person in an occupant inside the home that is in immediate need of aid or may die if they're, if they're not treated immediately. And it's a, a, a reasonableness that comes into play all the time, and it's, it's all judged after the fact, unfortunately. But it's reasonable to assume that if the house is on fire, then that law enforcement officer can enter the house, they can force them to enter the home and make sure there's nobody in it. And it's reasonable to assume that if there's a call of domestic violence and they can get there and hear gunshots, they don't need to seek a search warrant to go into the home. Um, that reasonable exemption has recently been extend, extended to animals. And it's, it's not, it would be the exception, not the rule. It's not, a, it's not something that we were running into very often, once or twice a year maybe. Would we be in a situation where we felt strongly, or that officer felt strongly enough that there were animal lives inside that home that were immediately in danger? We can get a search warrant relatively quickly, within hours, but this is a situation where that officer would have to believe that that hours are too, too long, that, that two or three or four or five hours are too long. Uh, and in this case, that exemption doesn't give the officer the right to do anything but go in and render aid to the occupants inside the building. Even if they went in and saw evidence of another crime, they have to back out and get a search warrant to continue past that. The exemption is strictly to provide aid. So are we going to have clear guidelines that we can look at to say in what instances we would, because there's going to be absence of visual sight here. So like fire obviously would be an easy one. The house is on fire, we're going to go in. But um, barking dogs inside the house, things like that, obviously, um, I just want the, when we're dealing with animals, human emotions tend to get involved real quick for a lot of us. And we hear a dog barking and barking and barking and barking, and we call pack. And it's like, okay, the dog has to been barking for, you know, for eight hours incessantly. Pack shows up. At that point, I mean, it's like, I just, I do look at liability for the county because it's like, you can't see that the dog is distressed. So and at I, what point do we determine it's okay to go in there and that we're not going to come for and, and, and just to sort of give this context, that, that is why we are so very early in for having conversations because precisely because of the complexities that you identify. This is this is not trivial. Um, if we open up the door and enter somebody's private premises, it is it is not trivial. I I wouldn't want somebody to open up my door and enter my private premises. How about breaking that door? How about breaking a window? How about, you know, it, it gets complicated really, really fast. And so and so that's part of the reason why we, we need to be thoughtful. We, we just want to let you know that, that we're in the process of beginning to explore how we get this done lawfully and appropriately because, because we know this is a, yes. a sticky one. Right. Yes. And if I can, real quickly to be, I'm sorry, kind of put your mind at ease. Uh, in the situation you're describing, no, that is not justification. Yeah, that's not exigent circumstances. Right. Yeah. I think and to be able to provide, uh, I think what you guys are looking for is, um, like in the circumstances of a hoarding case, um, you have animals that come to the window, and you'll find animals already laying at the window that you can medically assume that they are lateral, something needs to happen right now. And those are the cases that I think that we are aiming for. Um, and Dr. O can speak to this, is that you see these cats thin and the hoarding situations that they have all the same, um, what we call hoarding uh, symptoms of, they're thin, they have eye, um, eye uh, nasal discharge, and they're laying there, you tap on the window and they don't move, those are the things that we want to get in as soon as we can. Yeah, I just, because we're going to have to, if we do this, I mean, and, and don't get me wrong, it's like, I'm all for this, you know, um, but we're going to need to be able to, without a doubt, prove that we had probable cause for entering that home, and so the officers are going to have to be trained in exactly what is probable cause, knowing full well that there's a really good chance that they're going to be sitting in front of 
you know, in, in court and up on the stand defending their reason for going in there. So it, it, it does become, you know. I'm sorry, Paul. I, I, just, and, and I appreciate very much what you're saying. Uh, our officers already are, they, they do receive the training. Uh, again, this exemption is, is well tested. It's been tested in courts for many, many, many years for humans. And so this is this is it. You know, this is something that the exemption to enter a home or enter a residence in, in exigent circumstances has existed for a long time for humans. Uh, so we're, this is the the, the litmus test. The the, the the history of it is well documented. And, there. We're, and we're really like five five to ten percent of the work that needs to be done. This is really the only purpose for even mentioning this tonight is that we've had in the community some conversations about this issue recently. Uh, and the conversations are already happening in our community um, among volunteers and advocates. And so we wanted to let you know that we're working on it, addressing it, and looking for a solution to see if we even do have a viable option here. So we really, we recognize that there's a lot of uh, legwork still to be done, and we'll be updating you as we do that work. Okay, so I was just going to ask what we should expect. We should just expect some periodic updates for now, and then uh, maybe if necessary, uh, to assist with any kind of uh, suggestions for uh, legislative amendments or things like that? If, yes, if you're trying to that. that. I think that, that you can expect. We'll, we'll update you again at the, um, the next meeting. We'll have we'll some updates. Okay. Thank you. Um, old business. Uh, it's ongoing each month. Oh, the tents! <laughs> my favorite part of my new job. Uh, well, we've been in conversation with Christy, who's been just on it. And thank you for that. I think the staff do a remarkable job, and I, this team like continues to amaze me every single day by their diligence, but there are um, it is a large and daunting task to operate that facility with, at this point in this heat with the tents. Um, and so Christy's been um, tremendously helpful. We've been in conversation even today. Um, we, the te temperature continues to be, um, to fluctuate um, and get above 90 during the day. We have a protocol. What we're going to be doing the, at the end of this week and early next week is reviewing that protocol, making sure it's everything we need. Because Christy's brought up several important issues that aren't addressed. We're going to uh, we're going to engage Christy and a couple of other volunteers who are, have some intimate knowledge of this tent. We're going to revise that protocol and look at it again next week and get everybody on the same page and then in, ensure that everyone is receiving the same communication. Central Pet, our cleaning contract company all of our staff, all of our volunteers, and all of our other stakeholders so that we can all be on the same page as we move forward in these last uh, last stages of having this tent be part of our uh, our daily life. Any questions, comments about the tent? Okay. Thank you very much. New business. Uh, adoption follow-up. Well, I, I got, I received the, the communication from Joe this morning about this issue, and this is something that's been, this, adopt, this adoption return issue has been near and dear to my heart for many years, because as we see an increase in life saving, we naturally see an increase in adoption returns, but we also increasingly live in a culture where pets are expected to act like teddy bears. Um, and when they go home, the expectation is that they go home and they immediately adjust to being truly perfect animals and with no recognition of the, the trauma that is shelter life for most of our animals. And so it's a national problem. Um, rates of return haven't gone up too significantly in relation to um, outside of their relationship to the increase in life saving. But nonetheless, they're a real issue for us, particularly at PAC this time of the year. We're completely overcrowded, and there's a lot more we can be doing. And one of the key thing, one of our key first steps is getting our volunteers access to the shelter software system because our first plan is to form a volunteer-led um, team. We're going to do some targeted adoption follow-up to start with. We know that sending home a 10-week-old kitten um, to a family, it, it, we have a less likely 
our, our return is less likely than a senior dog um, who, uh, who maybe has incontinence issues. And so we're going to start to do some targeted volunteer-led follow-up, working with a team of volunteers who will be trained uh, in, in, in counseling for follow-up. Because with follow-up, we don't want to encourage people to bring the pet back. We want to make sure it's a good fit, give them the resources they need, and let them know that they do have an avenue for support if they need it. Um, and so we're going to start with that targeted follow-up. But it, I always say the adoption counseling process really starts the moment the pet walks out the door. And in the future, that's what we hope sheltering looks like, that people aren't listening when they're taking home their new family member. But we're hoping to manage their expectations while they're with us to really improve that counseling process so they're giving them as much information as we can. And then that relationship begins when they walk out. It only starts when they walk out. So they're getting an email follow-up from us. They're getting targeted phone correspondence is appropriate. And um, we can offer them some behavioral and medical resources. This isn't going to happen tomorrow. Um, the first step was to get volunteers the tools they needed to do it. The next step will be to form that group of volunteers who's going to work with us staff members to to create materials that will be standardized and will be used for all follow-up um, for, for each type of case, whether it's an older medical pet, a pet with behavioral challenges, um, and so on and so on. Thank you. Um, so last month, I think you saw the notes, I think it was July 15th, we had a vaccination clinic in South Tucson, and we were hopeful uh, that Kristen Michelle could update us on how the went. And, um, um, yes, I, it was amazing. Um, Barry was there, and it, I, he can, it, it was insane, I could say, but <laughs> it was amazing, insane, if that has any, <laughs> makes any sense to anybody. Um, we learned a few more things than we did the last time, um, but it's a really hard comparison because we had the event at PAC, which we have our own issues with being at the PAC um, property versus South Tucson Fire Department, which then gives their own issues uh, being on that property. Um, I can tell you that the South Tucson Fire Department were amazing. They provided over a thousand pounds of ice to us. Um, and at least uh, 40 packs of a large uh, bottle of water, um, and they provided that to the public. Um, we had, they had a great time with the fire hoses with the kids. Uh, they were spraying the, the public, um, so that was a heartwarming thing for me to see as far as like they got involved too. Um, there were council members that arrived and thanked us um, and asked when the next one was for their community. Um, but as far as that, we had a great um, amount of animals show up. Um, and there were people that we did have to turn away, but I can say that that's what then prompted me to think of, you know, we need to do this again in a few months. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, as far as the heat deal, um, we did have someone that, um, to, uh, fire department had to um, us basically sit down and, and walk them through, you know, hydration and all of that. Um, but it did help me understand that we probably need to focus more on the colder months of doing this than we do in the summer. Well, and, and I was at a conference and I got a call from Barry who said, "Come see this. It's amazing, and there's a lot of challenges happening." <laughs> 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 and uh, I couldn't. I was in Atlanta. But I understood, I've, I've gotten a little bit of a handle on what happened, and we know that the need is great. The communities come, we probably could have um, addressed 500 animals or more that day. Um, the community wants these services, and I think that two lessons learned are that the need is great, the community wants this, and, and secondly, that we need to do a better job of creating a system where there are not long waits. Uh, there were a number of senior folks waiting in line for a long time in the heat, and it's not only a safety issue for their pets and them, it's, an, it, it's just an overall customer service issue. And we want to provide excellent service, and I, I'm so proud of them for taking, our team for taking the leap and trying it, and now we know where we need to make some improvements. And, and perhaps um, um, uh, Mr. Chairman can speak to, the, um, to his experience at the event. Well, before, before you sort of turn it over to the chair, one of the things that I would add is, is that in order to get to that, 
Uh, there was a lot of pre-work that was done with the city manager for South Tucson. So, so this is the benefit of being in partnership with Pima County on the animal care um, interjurisdictional agreement. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's a really important story that I want to tell for the Holy Valley and for the city of Tucson. There is value okay. to the relationship. And because of that, that's, it, was the, it was the city manager that said, oh, it should be at the fire department. And, and we'll figure out how to get people there. And you know, I, I think and then our team obviously did the logistics and, and, and collaboration with, with volunteers and, with other uh, partners, but but I think this is one of those things where it, it's really important for me to articulate the fact that there is a lot of value in us being partnered formally through these intergovernmental agreements. The, uh, the we, we did a three-way partnership for two major events in the city of Tucson uh, a year and a half ago now, I guess, and one was at the Tucson Expo Center. Um, so the Humane Society came in with and they had the licensing for us, which was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, Josh and Jennifer and everybody were great on that. Um, we saw over uh, 275 animals there at, at Tucson Expo Center, packed. We had to turn people away, which is unfortunate because once you're out of vaccine, you're out of vaccine. So that's kind of it for the day. Yeah. And again, even even with a, it was still warm, but even with you know best planning, there is a huge need. Um, when we also had the council office of Ward Six, I believe we saw around 250 pets that day that, that we went, and that was between volunteers and again that three-way tie. So we value the relationship very much. It's been phenomenal. Um, we love being able to do the licensing where you can. We also recognize that in some areas it's, it's critical just to do um, the, the initial outreach because yeah. to ask for that, you know, $18 fee to, to, to come in, um, that's more than what some people can handle yeah. in some parts mm -hmm. of town. So it's great that you did it. That's very cool. My goal is to uh, get this TCC to <laughs> take one of their um, indoor cooled areas, warehouse type, or gym they hold space. Yeah, yeah, it's all. Awesome. That yeah. is my ideal place that I would like to do a very, very large event, which would also invite um, other veterinarians sure. to help in that. Well, we can, we'd be happy to talk about that, Michelle. I mean, that, that's something we could definitely look at. I work okay. with Linda Gemshaw Lee's up in the city as well, so I work with the TCC constantly. So, Great. yeah, we would need to time it. Yeah. It gets crazy, but, but yeah, and it's, it's a, it would be a great space for that. Very cool. Kristen? Did we have data on where these, all these folks came from? Because I, I met a lot of people that day that were not from South Houston. Mm -hmm. I'm just yeah, they, I don't have uh, data. I can get the data. I have all the, the sheets that we went through. Um, I could probably have it done by zip code. Um, but there was many people from not specifically South Tucson, but I think we'll find that regardless of yeah. where we stick the vaccine clinic. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I can assure you they probably weren't from Moran and Salarita. <laughs> 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 but the thing of it is, you, you've got to know culturally when you have events like that, it's the old family network. It is. The Teals and Theos and everybody else, and they join on. And, and you know, this crossover because yeah. right across the street is the city of Tucson. Oh, yeah. So you probably had a lot of people. Plenty of city residents. I know that Tamara can probably uh, tell you how that how that works when, right. when that event that happens in Casa Maria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, people go to that and you don't know where they come from. Yeah. But I can tell you, uh, having lived in the city of South Tucson all my life, they are there, but it's this kind of outreach that gets to the people who ordinarily don't get involved. Right. Right. And I, 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 think it's, I think it's great. I wasn't there, I was out of town that day. And so it's it, it's good to hear, but, but that's the way those things go down there. Well, it was, a, it was a really crazy, intense day. It was very hot. And uh, I don't think it's appropriate for me to dwell on maybe some of the things that we can improve next time around, we can take that offline. But I do think we have a couple of benchmarks. Uh, we definitely established that there's a demand for this in the community. Uh, and no matter where we do it, we're going to have that demand. So I think that that's something for us to take to the bank. And the second thing is, in terms of our credibility, I think that we need 
to follow up on our promise that we will continue to do it and be organized and be regularly communicating to the community what's happening. So for example, I was uh, one of the ones running around informing people that showed up past 8.30. 9 o'clock, we already had too many people in line and the spiel was, you know, you can continue to wait in line if you would like, but uh, by the time we get to you, it ended up being almost 3.30 in the afternoon, uh, there's a little chance that we're going to have the materials to be able to support you, plus it's over 100 degrees out. And so we turned away a lot of people, so they all wanted to know, well, uh, are you going to do it again? And we said, yeah, go to the PAC website, we're going to keep you informed, definitely. So, you know, our credibility in terms of just following up on this, letting everybody know that we're still working on it, we're going to have more, which is important to me. And we told them we may not be in South Tucson, it may be somewhere else. Um, but I think, I think we need to operate on that. And most people were in very good spirits, even though I was a little worried about some of the elderly people at times, even more so than the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just, you know, just issues with getting clear on our policies about watering animals. We were trying to use styrofoam. I went and bought several loads of styrofoam bowls and then they would disappear because we'd throw them away. And I don't know, it seemed like all the dogs were sharing water anyway, so I didn't know if that was really a contaminant. You know, but we need to figure those kinds of things out and how we're going to handle it. Um, and, um, And in the end, we had a volunteer out there who moved out the pack the other night when I was there who was washing dogs. And he was the guy spraying people with the hose. And he had a lot of fun. <laughs> so I think he ran out of the city of South Tucson's uh, water bills. <laughs> and, then, and then planning for supplies, because you know, I made the what, two or three yeah. trips back to pack to get, to get vaccine. And that's and I walked in and I was surprised that Dr. O'Donnell was holding down the floor to pack. Dr. Wilcox was at the vaccine clinic, so yeah. it was over. Yeah, that was one of the things I think we learned, is that we underestimated the amount of people that would show up. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, but we did the same thing when we did it at the pack property. We, we did, I mean, I personally didn't think people would show up in 110 weather to sit in line, and they do. Yeah. So. Little, little things like the fire chief, I told me, you know, I said, you know, next time let's have all the vehicles out from under the cover of parking so that people and dogs yeah. can stand under there, you know, that kind of thing. One of the, and one of the things we want to try to do next time is give people call information um, and make sure that they're leaving with the appropriate identification on their cards as well so that we can All right. Thank you. Um, and you already mentioned the volunteer access to community. Would you like to speak more on that? Uh, we're going to begin the training. I think did it start? Yes, it started. It started. Yes, it started. Yeah. Lines, lines. Yes, okay. It's already started. So Great. community, for those of you who don't know, is our information system that we use at PAC for now. And uh, thank you, Kristen, for uh, that uh, media. Uh, change and helping us get that through because I know it's uh, highly valued by all volunteers. And, uh, it's just hopefully it's going to make the job a lot easier and with enough information. So, um, and then um, licensing. We had it on the web, and I think you talked about that a little bit, but it came out of the lab. Yeah, you're, you're good. Okay, so we're down to. Uh, Announcements? Are there anything? <coughs> is there anything that the committee members would like to share? Can I ask a question? Sure. Maybe Kristen and Tino and everybody just giving us an outline for the fall if there's going to be any activity or announcements about the opening. Just as we're working with our representatives and our organizations, just September we're going to do this, October, November. <coughs> just yeah, to get us in. That, that is a great suggestion, and we're, work, we're actually working on it internally now. We can bring it. We'll have it completed by the next meeting. We'll have a rough outline. There's two things happening. There's move days, but then there's communication days as well, so we can bring that, uh, bring a rough outline next time. Um, we don't, 
Tino and I used to joke that we sort of have like one job that's the construction project and one, one job that's the rest of our job, but we've been in, we've been, um, planning is well underway and we're in, uh, we're in the final stages of planning phase one. And, and phase one is, in terms of the most complex operations, that's most of the organization. Um, all the medical, all the cats, all of that is in phase one. But we're going to be moved in by the 26th. We start that move at the beginning of December. And it is almost the beginning of September. So we're into the embers, yeah. uh, which means we're really getting close. Uh, so we'll bring you a timeline. And the plan for the public, um, the, the sort of public announcement about the new, the new shelter is the 28th of December. Um, and that's going to be a, that's not going to be a large event. We'll save the large event for the completion of the, the whole building, but this will be a small uh, news release and small media event. So I have a question, is there, are you guys going to bear the burden of the with all the staff and the county resources or do you really need to kind of organize the volunteer force to help with the community of the operation? We're going to be communicating with our volunteers. We're probably going to ask for a lot of help on a couple of key days because what we want to prevent is closing the shelter for any amount of time to move. And so we're, our goal is to stay operational 100% of the time. That's a lofty goal. So what we anticipate is having three days where we, we have all hands on deck days. One, the first one of those will be the moving of the veterinary um, suite and clinic. And we'll be asking everyone to come help us get moved in one day, get all those medical areas moved in one day um, so that we'll, we'll remain open, try to get it done um, mostly before we open for the day. If I can, I'm sure. The volunteers are going to be a big part of the big aid for us on that day when we remember we have 700 animals that we move to. So there will be an opportunity for, for very wide support. Uh, Dr. Smith. I'm going to assume that the day that we move the animals, you're going to have all the newscasts there watching that because I think it'll be a great thing on television to watch people moving the volunteers walking the pets into the new building. Yes, we're, we're going to identify. There's some. There's a number of opportunities for meeting engagement. One of the ones we're most excited about is moving the animals out of their current medical housing. Um, if, if any of you haven't been here to our pack, please come before the old contacts meet and come before the old building closes because it's truly going to be something to see. The hardest part for me about the whole facility is those medical areas. Um, we really don't have any housing for cats at all. Dogs are housed um, in X pens, which are those little round pens. Um, in that medical suite, and, the, and the, the, the environment is just, it's incredible to take into the animals there, but um, that day that we moved from that, that area to our new state of the art medical center, it's going to be truly a day to celebrate. We are, we are getting some great volunteers and, you know, it's just constant. 
we just always need more. But this time of year, um, you know, I, I do a guest group walk twice a week called Rough Runners, where we don't do any running right now because <laughs> it's way too hot. But if anybody wants to join that, I'll include that link. Um, you can come once uh, uh, or twice a week or either of those um, events, and we just get the dogs out for you, and you don't even have to. You're just a guest walking with. Basically, yeah, it's a mini guest walk with you twice a week. So I'll send that information with the flyer and we can recruit some extra guest walkers from inside of our circle or cat care uh, folks that are interested in that sort of thing. We need everything. Um, but with that in mind, with all these extra pets um, and with Christian's arrival, we have also been giving um, been given more uh, materials and training and ideas on how to network these pets and how to find different ways to like say. Um, focusing on things like fostering and getting animals out into uh, on day passes or overnight. Things that you know we've done a little bit in the past, but never as much as we really need to focus on more and more. Um, so that's pretty exciting. I think um, we're, we're getting more excitement within our little volunteer community and also you know, a little bit into the public uh, to help us with those sorts of things. So you'll start seeing, um, if you haven't noticed already, even our official human animal care Facebook page and things like that is growing and we're doing a lot more networking of pets, urgent pets, uh, hoarding cage pets, um, just general long timers and things like that. So that's really exciting because it's something that volunteers have wanted to see for a long time and I think it's helping already. So um, that's some exciting things um, and it was also mentioned on the report but we did have um, some compassion fatigue classes starting, which is really important, especially this time of year when we're uh, we're all really struggling. Um, so that's pretty exciting stuff, as well as the chameleon access that was brought up um, earlier. We, you guys have been hearing about that for months and months about how difficult it is for volunteers not to have access to the system, and how difficult it is for staff because we can't find them because they're you know busy. So uh, those are also really exciting things that are happening right now. That's all I have. You know, I, I just had one general comment about your question about the volunteers. Is, is, uh, I think one thing that we um, can probably try to figure out and help with uh, Gina with over time is when we need help, we just kind of shotgun through emails. And uh, it's this blast of information that doesn't really specifically identify a person. And maybe there's a way that we actually have volunteers that like to talk to other volunteers and we create a, a networking stream or something where we can, you know, like a phone tree kind of thing like we used yeah. to do in elections, uh, where we get people motivated for events and things like that because I know because we have the distribution of on the daily uh, adoptions that just, it's just, you know, every night you have 50, 50 emails on yeah. just people that, you know, the same way happened to this dog. And then mixed in there might be Gina's thing, you know. And I'm sure people just aren't focused on me. So it's just, just a fun. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, may I add yes. one, one more thing? Just very briefly. Our volunteer orientations have been held off-site for two hours, and at the end, you can't handle animals. And this was another sort of just like, this pain me when I heard this. We're going to be moving the volunteer orientations immediately back to the pack, and we're going to be teaching animal handling at the initial orientation, so that once people complete that initial orientation, at least they can handle some of our easier animals, because if people are so incredibly busy to ask them to come to an off-site orientation and then come to another training, it just, we basically knock, we, take, we start with 100 and we just keep knocking off pieces of it. And so we're going to make it as easy and quick to get them in, and that applies to fostering as well. We're going to start to process many fosters on the spot. There's no reason someone who's taken home one of our easy peasy senior dogs or cats can't fill out an a foster application and foster just as quickly as somebody can adopt. So we're going to be streamlining all of those and working with the volunteers and fosters in order to do that. Great, thank you. Okay, I'd like to uh, announce our uh, volunteers of the month. For this month, and uh, we have uh, Lynn Jo Namsik. Uh, Joe's been with PAC for almost four years, uh, with a total of 2,320 hours of PAC. Joe wow. comes in to walk dogs three to four days a week, uh, helps update the dog walking board, assists with taking pictures of our pets, and, and 
heads up the uh, CANS for Canines and Felines program. And since starting this donation program in 2015, it has raised $2,187. And Joe never asked for anything in return. And uh, is she here? So you guys are excited. <laughs> and, uh, the second one is Debbie Reed. And uh, Debbie's been with PAC for four years as a foster mom to all the kittens. And Debbie's a special volunteer and inspiration to all our foster families that take care of PAC pets. She coordinates get togethers with fosters and she's always answering questions on the foster Facebook page and always uh, writes very encouraging and positive posts. Most importantly, she takes in many bottle baby kittens and helps them back. Good choices. And uh, I don't have anything to announce this month other than to say that uh, I've been very, very happy uh, meeting Kristen, and uh, I appreciate her leadership, and, uh, and I just want to let everybody know that I'm excited about our future and where we're going, and that uh, I think that we have a lot of great things in front of us, so we all got to hang in there and keep plugging away. Um, call the audience. Is there anyone that would like to speak to us tonight for a few minutes? <coughs> <Get on those. laughs> so, uh, so, for the record, it's Marcy Bellamy. Bellamy? Yep. Hi. <laughs> Marcy with Nocto Pima County. And I wanted to just say a few words and make some recommendations that has to do with collaboration. Um, as you know, PAC doesn't exist in a vacuum, and the successes don't happen in a vacuum. And a lot of the um, experiences, uh, the successes and failures of, and ideas of other organizations in the, com in the community have a huge impact on the success of PAC because PAC relies on rescues and other, um, other partnerships. And, so I wanted to give an example, a story that is not a big deal, it's not a big example, but it's a recent one, and it's a no-kill Pima County story, and so I thought I'd share it. So back in April, back in March, Friends of Pat and Pat um, sponsored a conference on missing pets, a missing pet partnership brought in, and it was a real inspiring workshop. And you know, as a result of that workshop, No Kill Pima County decided to start a lost pet initiative and to help people um, prevent losing pets and then help them get their pets back to their owners. And so what we thought we would do would be kick it off in June with microchipping across the city, and, or across the county, actually. And so we thought one of those microchip events needs to happen at PAC. It just makes sense that it happened at PAC, and we would try and hit the different corners of the county. And so I met with Justin and asked what he thought about that, and he thought that's a really good idea. And so we, we had some d discussions about dates and, and you know, other places that No Kill Pima County would do it besides Pat. And within a few days, I heard from Justin that he got so excited about that. And he heard, I think it was Austin had done something that he saw that did a marathon at the shelter leading up to the 4th of July. So, which was obviously the June marathon was to prevent, to help the animals get lost on the 4th of July. And so he decided to bump it up a notch and he contacted the Humane Society and see if they wanted to get involved. And they did. And then he contacted AKC Chips, because you guys had just trans changed the chipping company you were using and bought 18,000 chips, they asked if they donate another thousand for a microchipping marathon across the county. And so, um, it became this really big or, or beautiful thing. It was the first time actually Humane Society, PAC, and No Kill Pima County partnered together mm -hmm. on a press release. Mm -hmm. and, and what No Kill Pima County would have done was probably three or four locations around town turned into eight locations around town. Mm -hmm. um, we did it at three points at the fire department, at the, at the Fire Department in Three Points. Um, we did it at, in Marana, and we did it at um, Dog Patch area, which some of you know of is a very poverty community area. And then um, we had uh, Twin Peaks participated. 
two ABC clinics participated, and Humane Society, I think that's all, there were eight of them. So instead of the idea we had, we were probably going to chip about 500 animals. Oh, and then another cool part of the partnership was Humane Society arranged for No Kill Pima County to get collars at cost. So we bought, I think, about six, 700 dog and cat collars so that anybody who came without a collar could have a collar and leave with one. And then we started getting more generous and saying, you know, if you just let us write a phone number on the collar, you can have a free one. Because that's even better than a microchip if they're wearing a collar. <laughs> it's just have your phone number on there. Um, so it was really a very cool event that uh, Oh, and the leftover collars and the leftover microchips were used at the South Tucson event. So that's the bigger story. And it's, and it's an important story, I think, that people recognize the big picture that we work together, that we can have cost savings if we work together, that we can have a bigger impact if we work together, and that we shouldn't just be focused on packed at 192 microchips that day. Because there were... 800 microchips that were done that month through a really nice collaboration. So I just wish that we would embrace that more often and talk about it more often and look at things that way instead of what happened to Chipak in one day. Um, and then I just wanted to say one other thing about the, the data, which is don't cut it back too much because <laughs> I, I like the detail. There aren't a whole lot of people in the community that like it, but I like that. I've been working with Josh regularly since he started the um, dashboard, improving it. It's changed each month almost because I want people, I want it to be user friendly and that people can figure out the save rate by plugging in the numbers looking on that dashboard. You can't. I mean, it's, but we were getting there. <laughs> we were working on that so that anybody could pick that up and see the big picture. So I do like the color representation better, but I don't want to lose the details in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jane. Yes. I'm Jane Schwerin. I'm president of People for Animals and the Prevention of Cruelty and Neglect Incorporated. And I'm I have, I've had a question about the search warrants, and uh, I believe that you could, you could, you could answer my question because it's on the agenda. And when, when I ask a question that's on the agenda, it's my understanding that you can, you can answer. And it's a, it's about, it's about the search warrants. That it, it's, it's my understanding that um, search warrants can be gotten. Quickly, and uh, uh, apparently I'm wrong, or am I wrong, or why, why were you why were you saying that it takes five or seven hours to get a search warrant? Has that been your experience? Thank you. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's um, not that I heard you say <coughs> it could be as quick as two hours. They could be. They could be gained quickly. There's. To get a search warrant, first of all, the officer has to be a probable cause, then we have to do the application for the warrant, the judge has to sign it. Um, we're working right now to get PAC eligible to do telephonic warrants, which are much quicker. Telephonic warrants can be sometimes half an hour to an hour. But, but currently, not that. currently, right now, we don't, we're not authorized to use telephonic warrants. But, but uh, the, it, it, the time of day, the location, the availability of a judge, uh, these all, all can factor into it. It could be two hours, it could be the next day. Uh, what, what do you mean when you say you're not authorized to use telephone search warrants? We're working right now with different jurisdictions and with the county to have the, the agency recognized to receive tele telephone warrants. Who, who would authorize you or withhold this authorization? The courts. So, yeah. The courts, the courts authorize that, and that would be both the municipal courts and the county courts. And it's going to depend upon the jurisdiction and the judge that they have to interact with. So it, it, it would be a, a reciprocal relationship created between the county courts and the city courts. And authorizing, any time you go through any type of telephonic process, the city and the county, but both of them and in, in other elements of uh, including video uh, testimony, they've done it uh, to protect domestic violence victims, things of that nature. 
that's, there's, a, there's a pretty detailed process people have to go through to make sure that they meet all the legal requirements to effectively proceed using that structure to protect the rights of all those involved, both the persons considered the victim and or the persons who are considered the perpetrator. So it's a pretty complex process that their attorneys will, will easily be able to work out with folks, but it, it takes time to go through that cycle. Yeah, so what we will do is we'll make a note that as we go through further discussions, uh, we might want to do a, a, at some point a review of what the warrant process is so the public understands what we're talking about. That would be great. We can talk about that in a little bit. We appreciate it. Okay. And that's even before the telephonic one. Yeah. I mean, just what yeah. is the warrant process? Exactly. And what does it mean? That would be great. We'd be happy to send Yeah, and you know, it may be just a clarification of uh, where we're lacking versus what a regular police officer may do with the telephonic or whatever, just so we know what our deficiencies are. Or, I mean, they're not deficiencies. Thank you. Um, with that, I would ask for a motion for a Second. All in favor, please.